We will open this morning's session with a talk by Dr. Dr. Soli Shahfar from the University of Haifa. He will speak to us on the topic of opening and closing the door, the state and the Baha'i schools in Iran. This will prove to be a, a very, very interesting topic, and I, for one, am very much looking forward to hearing about it. Let me tell you just very briefly about Dr. Shahfar. You can read more about him in your program. <clears throat> Dr. Shahfar teaches in the Department of History and the Middle East and is the director of the ISRI Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at the University of Haifa in Israel. He holds a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, and he's the author of The Forgotten Schools, The Baha'is and Modern Education in Iran. I welcome Dr. Shafar. We very much look forward to your presentation. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish to thank the uh, Association of Baha'i Studies, North America, uh, for inviting me here, especially uh, Mrs. Khorsandi, uh, Mr. Uh, Kiai, Mr. Uh, Moke, Mrs. Uh, Rouhani, and uh, Mr. Jamshida Amini, who helped me, invited me, and uh, um, became uh, uh, friends, I believe, at least on my part. <laughs> um, <clears throat> every time that I uh, speak or deliver a lecture on uh, uh, Baha'is, um, on Baha'is of Iran, I usually do, it's uh, usually people uh, automatically think I'm a Baha'i. So just for the record, I'm not. Um, once or twice I spoke, gave a lecture on uh, Zoroastrians in Iran, and at the end of the lecture, people would come and say, are you, Shoma uh, are you a Zoroastrian? I said, no. So then I decided that it is better to refrain from delivering talks on uh, a, a, a Iranian women. So. So what, uh, I have a lot of slides, and uh, most of them are actually photos, which I want to share with you because I think they are unique. So I will run with the text uh, as, uh, as fast as uh, possible in order to, to be in the framework of the 50 minutes uh, time allocated to me. So what we are talking about Baha'i schools, what are these Baha'i schools? Schools owned, established, and run by Baha'is. What are the characteristics of Baha'i schools? They had no religious studies in the curriculum. They had Dars e Akhlaq, but this was on Fridays when the school were in recess, either in the school or uh, in the local mahfal, and uh, not with the non-Baha'i students. So they separated the religious studies from the regular curriculum. They followed the curriculum of the Iranian Ministry of Education, uh, they followed the local practices as to separation of the sexes, outdoor appearance, wearing chador and uh, whatever is needed, or taking off the chador during the Reza Shah period, etc. They kept a relatively high standards in teaching, teaching staff, teaching accessories, enrichment classes, etc., which made them, of course, of a more higher standard in relation to many other schools. They were attended by many uh, non-Baha'is, some of whom from the local aristocracy, including the aristocracy of Tehran. Sorry. Um, I'm asking actually two fundamental questions. How come uh, in a state, in a Shiite state, which uh, or under the regime of the Qajars, there were so much persecuted these Baha'is from the, when they were Babis and later most of them uh, became Baha'is, from the mid-19th century onwards, 
killing uh, uh, thousands of uh, Baha'is, persecuting them uh, under very harsh uh, circumstances. How come this is the regime that affords the Baha'is to open schools? It's a, it's a, it's a privilege, yes, to open schools. So how come? It's, it didn't make sense to me. So then I uh, started to think about it, how, how it uh, could happen. And the other question is that how come a, a, a ruler like Reza Shah Pahlavi, secular, modernizing, reformist, which his views very much corresponding to some of the main principles of the Baha'is, he's the one that actually closes the Baha'i schools. So two fundamental questions that I uh, uh, try to uh, uh, give uh, at least uh, potential answers. Sorry. Well, regarding the first question, the possible reasons for the opening of the at least first-run Baha'i schools uh, by Muzaffar Adin Shah, which were afterwards followed by other schools. In my uh, humble opinion, uh, the main reason for opening those schools was connected to the process of reform in Iran. And in order to understand this, we have to look from different dimensions. Well, when I say reform, um, um, uh, the field of reform is in general, but education in particular. I would refer to the, uh, to the both. State's role. What interest the state had in this? From the beginning of 19th century, uh, Iran, uh, shall, we can say that the, the, um, sorry, the, the clash with the West was in the military field, as it happened with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and as it happened with the Ottoman Empire, it was mainly with Russia. Yes, two wars against the Russians at the beginning of the 19th century, losses of territory, losses of, uh, uh, of people, Muslims, two uh, heretic Christian uh, uh, empire. Uh, the Iranians, like the Ottomans before them, they started to ask what can be done in order to bridge this gap in order to bring us closer to this uh, power of the West, in order to be able to do, uh, stand before them. So the idea was reform, because the first clash or first, uh, shall we say, encounter was in the field of the military, then the reform was naturally in the field of military reforms. But as Iran lost in other wars, after those with the Russians, against either local uh, armies that, were, uh, um, um, that underwent reform or they were supported by uh, um, uh, European powers, or I, later in the clash or in the war against the British in 1856-57, uh, they continued to lose. So the idea was then if reform is needed, then it's not, it shouldn't be only limited to, uh, to uh, uh, the military field. In other words, the secret is not only the secret of the, um, um, uh, pre, um, the uh, power of the West is not only in the military, it must be in different things. So ideas started to shape in the mid-19th century regarding the education, the need for doing a new educational system. But this understanding wasn't an uh, understanding that uh, uh, was uh, shared by the then king uh, Nasser Din Shah for the entire of the population. Uh, he opened the um, uh, Dar al-Funun in 1851 for the Iranian aristocracy. Most of the majority of the Iranians didn't uh, uh, have any access to this uh, modern education. It was very uh, limited to a number of very selected people. So we cannot talk about modern education for the entire people. Um, Few schools, more schools in 1858, in the 70s, and then uh, in the um, uh, 90s and in 1900, they were uh, continued to open. But again, these were for the specific needs of the state, whether for uh, cadres in military or in the bureaucracy, but it wasn't for the entire population. A section of the Iranian populations, even from the lower classes, had already enjoyed um, modern education from the 1830s. These were the Christians, with the missionary uh, waves of American Presbyterian, then the French Catholics, and the British Anglican. 
churches moving into Iran and opening schools throughout uh, the Christian areas of Iran. So the majority Shiite population remained uneducated, or at least uneducated in terms of modern education. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, this, the, the global circumstances, the uh, fall of uh, or, um, the technological uh, transfer or the technological modernization, uh, modernization mainly in the terms of in the field of uh, uh, communications, like the telegraph, yes, later the wireless radio, uh, um, took Iran out of its seclusion and brought it more in immediate contact with the world. Ideas of the French Revolution that happened some hundred years before began to infiltrate uh, gradually from uh, mid uh, 19th century, but more so towards the end of the uh, 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And all these things uh, stimulated a process of, uh, of uh, reform. The bureaucracy needed to be reformed in order to, uh, um, to become more efficient. Uh, the, um, in the, every field, not only education, in the field of uh, and military, in the field of, uh, for example, uh, uh, municipal uh, affairs, in the field of, uh, um, um, uh, well, the concessions actually were the concession given to uh, foreign companies. They were actually given in order to, uh, to develop certain fields, whether it is in terms of communication, railways, telegraphs, and so on, or in terms of irrigation, from the classical form of uh, uh, irrigation into moving into new form of uh, 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 irrigation, and so on and so forth. So the state had an immediate interest in uh, opening more modern schools. We don't know why yet Baha'i schools, yes, but... And the role of the non-Baha'i Iranian intellectuals and activists from more or less uh, um, beginning of the 20th century, when, uh, excuse me, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, uh, students were sent abroad to study. At, the, at first there were two students, then five, then 30, and the numbers grew. And the gaps between each uh, delegation of students sent abroad was a long one, but still students were sent abroad. Those were exposed to ideas of the West, and some of them became intellectuals, yes, in the, in the Iranian context, and they, they start talking about uh, the need for uh, modernization. One of those, for example, one of the more known ones is Mirza Malcolm Khan, an Armenian that his father became a Muslim, Muslim, and he studied in France, came back, and he started to talk about, uh, about these ideas of, uh, um, of uh, a need for education and modern education. Another one was uh, Akhundov or Akhundzadeh. And there were many other uh, um, intellectuals that were talking about this. So we see that actually the atmosphere becomes more and more pro-reform in education. Role of non-Baha'i religious minorities. I mentioned the missionaries, mission, uh, the Christian missionaries that acted. So the Christians, uh, the Jews also uh, began they, they actually, in the 1870s, they uh, uh, received the per first permission, but the first Baha'i uh, Jewish, uh, modern Jewish school start, uh, start began only in 1898, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, or Kiach in uh, Hebrew. Um, and the Zoroastrians, um, Hateria was one of the leading Zoroastrians, uh, businessman from uh, India, from Bombay, or Mumbai today. And uh, he uh, received uh, uh, donations from the Zoroastrian community, moved to Iran, and began to open also one of the things he had done, uh, to open schools. But the Baha'is, of course, were the last. Um, <clears throat> role of the Babi Baha'i reformist thought and practice. Yes, the Baha'is for themselves, of course, is a central theme of uh, education and universal education in the Baha'i uh, faith. So they had their own reason of uh, wishing to open uh, schools. So the idea of reform and the need for schools there was existent in the 
in Iran in different levels. Gradually, uh, pressure started to come from the people, the Shiite people, the Shiite population, not only the aristocracy, but from the below, from the grassroots level. Because more and more, on the one hand, the state needed uh, qualified cadres for different sections, and more and more, uh, with the processes that I described before, people understood that in order to get out of this uh, uh, dire situation that they have, their kid, usually their son, needs to go and study a, uh, in a modern school, then have a profession, and then he can take them out of this uh, uh, dire position. So more and more, we, we see gradually more pressure coming from below on the government to supply new uh, schools, modern schools. So with this kind of pressure, I assume that, uh, and with the inability of the state to provide those, uh, to meet those pressure or meet those demands, the state uh, decided to give the Jews and finally also the Baha'is. Although I mentioned later uh, that the Baha'is weren't given, as the other religious minorities, the permission to open uh, um, uh, schools as a community, but it was done by individual Baha'is and not under there being a Baha'i, but an Iranian, yes? Uh, another reason is Muzaffar Adin Shah's character. Uh, he was a, a weak a monarch, Sikh also, but he had some liberal tendencies. He knew French, he was uh, reading also French uh, books, I don't want to say literature, I mean uh, the French language in terms of uh, uh, such a level that he can read the poetry, but uh, he read the French books. He traveled to Europe. He was uh, uh, kind of a more liberal than his father. And uh, it might be that he was less, uh, uh, he had less um, anti-Baha'i feelings than therefore he was he didn't care so much that the Baha'is will open schools as long as they meet those demands of no Baha'i mention in the plague name of the school or uh, the Baha'i community being given the right. Uh, whoever knows the, or familiar with the Qajar uh, in particular, but Iranian setting, bribery is one of the main things to move things on it happens today as well it happened during the shah it happened during the Qajar as well uh, but could bribery be a, a possibility uh, after all all these concession given to foreign companies uh, were part of it they had actually a clause giving to the monarch some amount considerable amount of money but it is in my view unlikely that the bahais paid money as a bribery because of this is against their principle and uh, Abdul Baha actually uh, speaks about uh, that very clearly. So it is the most unlikely. Uh, another possible reason could be the influence the Baha'is could have through Baha'i connections with Western countries, mainly Britain, Russia and the United States. Britain and Russia were very influential in Iran during the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in 1907, uh, you probably know, most of you, uh, that they divided the country between uh, themselves uh, into spheres of influence, and they were actual rulers. Uh, <clears throat> and um, um, we know of, of good relations that existed between the British and the, the Baha'i leadership. The Russians, according to uh, research we have been conducting in the Russian archives, uh, and found many documents that indicating that the Russians actually had a policy based on the Baha'is. Uh, in short, I would say that they uh, um, uh, wanted uh, or regarded the Baha'is as a tool to pressurize the Qajar uh, uh, regime uh, in order to get uh, some concessions, whether uh, these are against the British or for uh, themselves. Uh, but there was a school of, uh, of um, I wouldn't say taught, but a school in the foreign policy uh, or the, more the imperial 
a, a Russian uh, a strategist, uh, part of them in the foreign ministry, part of them in the army, that actually thought uh, that uh, the, the Baha'is could be uh, used as a tool to pressurize the uh, uh, Qajar government, given the, the fears that the Qajars has because of the Babi movement and the development of the Baha'i faith and the growing community of Baha'is in Iran. Another uh, uh, circumstantial explanation could be a more lenient and relaxed atmosphere towards the Baha'is since the last years of Nasruddin Shah. Actually, Baha'u'llah himself uh, admits that in the last years of Nasruddin Shah, things are relaxing. The persecution against the at least from the point of view of the state. The state is not so active or even uh, not active at all in persecuting the Baha'is. If there is a persecution, is the ulama and the clerics are leading it. It was such an atmosphere that uh, even Baha'u'llah, uh, there is a quote in my book that uh, actually uh, prohibits critic, uh, criticism against the, the regime. Another explanation is differenti differentiating the, the Qajar state between the disobedient and subversive Babis versus the obedient and loyal Baha'is. The literature on 19th century Iran <coughs> you can see that it, there is a big confusion between Babis and Baha'is. And in many instances, you say Babis and they mean Baha'is. Yes, because most of the community, as I said, as, and as you perfectly know, they became Baha'is. But by the end of the 19th century, there it seems to be an indication that there was an ability to differentiate between the two. Therefore, okay, let the Baha'is have a, the obedient, yes, Baha'is have their... Uh, uh, schools, and uh, we, of course, continue to uh, persecute the Babis. Well, as uh, I mentioned before, and another reason, which was more, I would say, to, uh, to try to diminish the opposition towards the opening of Baha'i schools, was the fact that Baha'i schools weren't registered under the names uh, of the Baha'i community, but under the names of individu individual Iranians without the mention of their uh, faith. <coughs> what interest had the Baha'is in opening the schools? Well, first of all, the importance of education in Baha'i faith. Yes, it is one of the pillars of the faith is the education. So therefore, there was a natural for the Baha'is willing to have schools. And uh, given the circumstances as I described, it was uh, understood by mainly Abdul Baha that it was a ripe time to propel the Baha'i community in Iran from obscurity into the open. And also, through that education and through that schools, uh, to secure the future growth of the Baha'i community. Because in those schools, as you well know, not only Baha'is studied, but also many non-Baha'is, and uh, which uh, some of them is yes, uh, uh, converted. And so with, without such a, a framework, uh, it would, the growth of the Baha'i community would have been much slower or even uh, diminishing. Um, this is uh, more or less some of the explanation that I uh, reached at or found uh, as far as the clo um, uh, opening of the school, uh, of the Tarbiyat Banin or Tarbiyat Pesarane in 1898-99, uh, and uh, afterwards uh, other schools. Now I move to the other question is, uh, what happened that the Reza Shah the reformist, the modernizer, the secular, the anti-clerical Reza Shah is the one that actually closes those schools in December 1934. Well, the official reason is that the Baha'is did not observe the state guidelines, namely closing some schools on, date, on a date that was not an official state declared holiday. That was the official, but... Uh, in my view, you have to dig, and there must be other reasons or other uh, supporting 
uh, uh, reasons that brought the Shah to decide. So what possible reasons, other possible reasons for closing the Baha'i schools? Well, it seems from the uh, documents that I found that there has been a previous warning against the Baha'is a year before on the same 28th Sha'aban, but this time in 1933, that the Baha'is closed that, uh, those schools uh, because it wasn't the first time that those schools were closed, uh, which enraged Reza Shah. Enraged Reza Shah because there wasn't, uh, in, in his eyes, the Baha'is who were not recognized as a religious minority, they were considered as other Iranians. Therefore, as other Iranians, they have to obey the regulations. Then if the official of the, um, the, the, the public schools are open, then should, they should be open. So that was a disregard of the regulations. In that case, what made uh, Shoghi Effendi decide, then leader of the Baha'i community, to, in spite of the warning, to, open, to close those schools also a year later in 28 Shaban of uh, 1934. And there is a correspondence between uh, uh, the leadership of the Baha'i community in Tehran and the head of the Tarbiyat school with Shoghi Effendi. Uh, are you sure that we have to close again because there was a threat, there was a warning. It could be uh, um, had a major uh, uh, repercussion, negative repercussions. Then I believe that the Shoghi Effendi had a strategy. And what was uh, his strategy? He wanted to seek public recognition of the independent nature of the Baha'i faith in Iran. And he found the time ripe to demand full religious freedom in matters strictly in his views related to their belief, as other religions. In other words, the time in his uh, view was ripe to say, okay, that's enough, you played with us, you know, you disregarded our rights, we have, we are a distinct religion, we have rights, and uh, we want to keep those rights, we will remain ob uh, obedient citizens of the, of the state, but in matters who is between us and our God, we don't want, uh, we want our freedom. So that was a major decision. <clears throat> and this could, of course, have a negative uh, uh, reaction by the Reza Shah, who was a very fearful character. Uh, my father was uh, serving as a soldier in the headquarters of the military during his military service in Tehran. And he says, he, uh, he always told me that uh, whenever Reza Shah would come, in the office, everybody looked down. And there was a, Reza Shah was a tall man, so if you want to look at him, you have to look up. And uh, people didn't dare to look at his uh, eyes. He was a very fearful character. Uh, his career, military uh, officer, grown up under the, in the service of the Russian uh, Cossack Brigade. And he, he learned what is Russian discipline. He was a man with strong hand. And he didn't, in my view, he regarded that uh, um, um, decision by Shoghi Evendi or the Baha'is as a, something very uh, contrary to his policy. Another development which I think helped uh, or assisted Reza Shah in reaching this decision of uh, closing the, the schools is in the election of the first National Spiritual Assembly, which happened the 26th April 1934, uh, the Spiritual Assembly in Iran. <laughs> this was a major step, major stage in the institution, institutional development of the Baha'is of Iran. As far as the Baha'is were communities in local places, in distant places, that's something. But when they are organized as a, with body and leadership outside the country, and the elections and the national uh, structure, that was something else. Another explanation is uh, the existence of uh, anti-Baha'i elements within the Pahlavi state. Most notably, Muhammad Ali Furughi, Dr. Shapur Asikh and uh, Abdul Hamid Ashraf Khavari believe also that uh, Ali Asghar Hikmat, then Minister of Education, was also 
one of those anti-Baha'is. Um, they try to convince the, the Shah that the Baha'i schools are a weapon to convert non-Baha'is to the Baha'i faith, then make them bigger in number. With the institutional uh, development that they had, they might become a threat to the regime. So in the very suspicious character of Reza Shah, this constant um, 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 you know, uh, expression of fear or expression of anti bai expressions, they probably played some, uh, some part. There is also uh, um, um, Iranian uh, political and uh, activist and uh, author, Ihsan Tabari, in his memoir, he writes that uh, these guys, Furughi, Hikmat, and, uh, and other, uh, others like Sirus Ghani, they were part of a, a, a shall we say, a mystic uh, uh, no, a group of people who were studied Irfan and were uh, regarded the Baha'is as uh, some kind of a, in a very rival, uh, competing way. So they had their own interest to, uh, to try to uh, you know, uh, uh, harm them. Um, something that I indicated er earlier, but uh, another reason is growing suspicion of Reza Shah regarding the Baha'is, especially Baha'i universalism versus Pahlavi nationalism. The, the type of state that the Reza Shah was trying to create was most than anything else is a nation state, a nation state that has uh, wishes to break the sub national loyalties and supra-national loyalties. Sub-national loyalties, whether it is to the tribal leader or to the uh, village headmaster or uh, some other level, sub-level, sub-national level, or to supra-national uh, level, which is something to the religion, to Islam, to Baha'ism, to Judaism. You want to, to break and to create a loyalty of the Iranians to the state and through the state to the Pahlavi regime. So he found this development of the Baha'is with the leadership outside and with the obedience of the, his Iranian Baha'i subject of Shoghi Efendi rather than Reza Shah in the example of closing the schools in spite of the regulation as something that he wasn't ready to agree. Therefore, he started to identify the Baha'is as disloyal and disloyalty in terms of somebody like Reza Shah, a military man with a strong hand, this was, it had to be harsh reaction. And this is a man actually that uh, got rid, rid of his most uh, trusted uh, uh, um, advisor, uh, Taymur Tash, uh, throw him to jail and then executed him. Another uh, uh, explanation could be the Baha'i religious application versus Reza Shah secular application of education. Yes, the Baha'is, uh, uh, you know it better than me, of course, the main uh, application of education is in religious terms. Uh, um, and the Reza Shah being a very secular might have uh, seen that as uh, uh, something that is not uh, uh, in line with his own policies. Baha'i contacts and good relations with foreign elements. If this played uh, some 30 something years uh, earlier for the opening, for the, the benefit of the Baha'is to open schools, at the time of Reza Shah, it was a disadvantage. Because again, as a national, nationalistic person who tried to get rid not only of domestic strife, but also of uh, uh, foreign presence in Iran. And we can see this through uh, different acts that he done. For example, the cancellation of all the concessions, of foreign concessions in Iran. Gradually, he canceled everything. There was only one that he renewed. There was the oil concession given to the British that he canceled in 1932, but then he, uh, his government uh, actually uh, renewed this under different terms in 1933. But he canceled the concession. He uh, created a very uh, strong uh, army, at least 
for domestic purposes, and he established uh, um, Air Force, uh, Navy, which became, or, um, in my view, he had the intention of, you know, gradually uh, kicking the British out of the out of the south of Iran and gradually out of uh, uh, Persian Gulf. Something that his son managed to do in, in more or less in 18, uh, 1971. But it was, of course, after the British decision in 1968 to withdraw from the Gulf. <clears throat> in this respect, of course, the British had a very negative image in Iranian society, and they still have, as you Iranians know here, that everything that happens in Iran, at least the older generation, they're always attributed to the British. Um, Another uh, issue is the size of the Baha'i community along with the geographical and social spread of the Baha'is versus other religious minorities. Other religious minorities were small in number, secluded in one place or in a ghetto, in a one section of the, uh, one geographical section in the country. Very distinct. The Baha'is were in all social strata. Yes, from top, from the prince, Qajar princes down to uh, to the grassroots level and in everywhere in Iran. So uh, this might be, uh, this combined with what I described earlier, institutionalization and all this uh, na uh, su supranational and uh, versus the national could have, of course, helped uh, uh, to, uh, the, the, towards that decision of uh, Reza Shah. Uh, and in line to the same thing, the large attendance of Muslim students at the uh, Baha'i schools might have alarmed him that there is a potential growth of this uh, community. Um, <clears throat> Another explanation, which is very, which is indicated too by the studies done by Elisa Nasarian and uh, Hushangi Shehabi, is that the <coughs> Baha'is, as uh, the Iranians among you probably know it best, they were, uh, you know, a, a tool that uh, could be sacrificed, uh, a scapegoat, in Iranian, in the domestic Iranian uh, power politics. When, uh, for example, uh, the Nazis uh, came to power in Germany in 1933, one of the first victims were the communists. There were a large presence of uh, Iranian students who were studying in Germany at the time, and some of them, led by Taghi Arani, uh, they were communists, um, and they were quite active. So once the Nazis went up to the, and seized the power in Germany. They fled. Where they go back? They go back to Iran. And they renewed or uh, stimulated the communist or dormant communist activity in Iran. And uh, in order to uh, um, fight against the growth of this uh, communist influence, the, it, could, it could be possible that the Reza Shah wanted the uh, support of the clerics. Because the communism being atheists, of course, so uh, a religious a leadership could be a good a partner for combating these atheists, these uh, heretics. So, in that respect, he might, um, might have wanted to sacrifice the Baha'is in, in order to win their uh, support. But in other instances, we can see that, the, for example, in order to introduce social reform, the Baha'is, for example, in the question of uh, uh, women. And the appearance in public, for example, with the clothes, the Baha'is were the first to, uh, to be ordered to, uh, to appear uh, outside of their homes without, uh, in Western clothes, without chador. Uh, <clears throat> and in certain, there are certain instances that I mentioned that the, um, that the Shah actually protected the Baha'is in order to, you know, to irritate the clerics. So the Baha'is were kind of a a scapegoat in the policies of uh, Reza Shah. Another uh, explanation, possible explanation, is the Turkish model. Yes, we know that uh, uh, many of the reforms introduced into Iran during the Reza Shah period was an imitation, or they were modeled after the, the attempts done in Turkey by his uh, uh, co-military 
colleague, the Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. <coughs> Um, in Turkey, they done nationali nationalizing uh, public, religious, private, and foreign schools, with Baha'i schools being sacrificed first. Uh, so uh, it could be that uh, uh, this also played or influenced the Shah to do the same. There was also a negative attitude of Turkish authorities toward the Baha'is, which could, might have also influenced the Reza Shah. Um, I would now move, I suggest if there is questions, because I'm now moving towards uh, showing you a number of uh, photos, so we can uh, start with the questions and then I can complete with the follow-up of the photos. Or you want me to show and then, uh, as you wish. I mean, it's no. No, for me it's very important that they see the, the photos. So I will, uh, I will go through them uh, one by one. This is the Taid Boys School in 1908. Um, it's written there, Madrasa Mubarakay Taid in the sign. I don't know, you will see it clear. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a number of uh, Taid school uh, photos. That's a graduation of intermediate students at the Taid Boys School. There's no date on that uh, photo. <coughs> it's uh, Mr. Etahadiyeh in the middle, seated. The Taid Boys School, again, you can see the sign of Madrasa Mubarak Taid there at the top. Uh, graduation of intermediate students at the Taid Boys School, Hamadan, founded in 1908, and the picture is from 1925-26. Again, Taid Boys School, again, again, Taid Boys School. It's a lot picture of a larger uh, group of uh, Taid students in 1908, the foundation year. <coughs> Again here. Now this photo, I couldn't put my finger what is it exactly. I, of course, all the photos from the archives of the uh, Baha'i War Center, and they are copyrighted to, to them. Uh, but this one is a written there, Madrasa, as you can see, uh, those who know Persian. Uh, there is a sign on the right, which is in Russian, and it's written uh, Ibrahim Yusifov. So I'm not sure whether it is a sign of a street or it is a sign of the school. Uh, so it could be, if it is the sign of the school, uh, that it is somewhere uh, in Russian territory, which probably is either Ashgabat, Baku, or some other place that there are Iranian communities in Tsarist Russia. But again, this is a school. Uh, <clears throat> this is management committee of the Tehran Tarbiyat schools uh, in uh, Baha'i Era 88, 1932. A group of pupils at the Tehran Tarbiyat girls school, probably mid 1920s, at the center in dark dress, Princess Ashraf Pahlavi. She and Muhammad Reza Shah, or Muhammad Reza, yes, they attended the, the Tarbiyat boys and girls school respectively. Um, when a group of Zoroastrians saw this picture, they said, what are you talking about? This is not, uh, not Baha'i, this is Zoroastrian, the white clothes, this uh, Zoroastrian thing. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um, the Tarbiat Boys School, Tehran, seated at the center, Dr. Susan I. Modi, Moody, who was uh, one of the main figures in the development of modern education, modern Baha'i education in Iran. Students of Darsa Akhlaq for Girls, Tehran, 1939. Of course, after the closure of the uh, schools. English class, it's written on the, actually on the board. Yes, uh, Tarbiat Boys School, Tehran, 1910. A group of Baha'i women and children attending the Women's Emancipation Celebration, Save branch of the Ministry of Education, probably mid-1930s because of the uh, Western clothes that the uh, women and children wear. A Baha'i girls school, uh, probably 18, uh, 1930s, because of Reza Shah and the clothes, of course. Ceremony for granting certificates of excellence 
to a students Wahdat de Bashar Boys School, Kashan, 1930-31. You see the Pahlavi uh, cap, which is a uh, very uh, typical of that period. Student and staff of the Wahdat de Bashar Boys School, Kashan, 1909, which is because of their appearance, of course, also supports that uh, date. It's uh, before Pahlavi period. Uh, so student and teachers of the second grade class Tarbiyat Boys School, no date. And here we have a number of those uh, students of the Tarbiyat Boys School in Tehran during sport examination. You can see that there are uh, even officials of the state, of, of the Ministry of Education, uh, among the, the present uh, uh, VIPs. Ceremony at Tarbiyat Boys School, Tehran. Uh, this is the cover of my book. Uh, I chose it mainly because of the, there could be no uh, Zoroastrian coming and telling us this is a Zoroastrian. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Tavakol uh, Girls School, Qazvin, 1928. And again, the Tavakol Boys School, Qazvin, 1922. Tarbiyat Boys School. Student of Sport Class, Tarbiyat Boys School, Tehran. And then the sixth grade, Tarbiyat Boys School, number of, uh, that's a fourth grade, uh, fifth grade. First grade of intermediary level. Um, again, that's a Darsa Akhlaq uh, class. That's the order of closure of the Tarbiyat uh, schools, Pesarane, uh, for boys and girls, issued by uh, Ali Asghar Hikmat to the manager of the Tarbiyat Banin, the, the Tarbiyat Boys School. And now here there are some samples of Karname, uh, of um, uh, certificates in Persian on one side and English on the other side. You can see here uh, under the uh, name of the pupil is uh, Mirza uh, Nur din No, it's... Uh, no, um, the name of the father is uh, Esme Vali, and on the left side is Janab Mirza Shahab, and uh, Esme Shagird, which is the name of the student, is uh, Nurullah. Yes, Nurullah. <coughs> and of course, we can see the we can uh, get an uh, impression of what they studied: uh, Quran, Shariat, Farsi, Arabi, Adabiyat, Tariq. Tariq Iran, Tariq Umumi, Tariq Anbiya, Ta'alimat Madaniye, Elm wa Ashiya, Zaban, which is important, you know, language, Hesab, Mathematics, Hendese, Geographia, Geography, uh, Geometry, Geography, Jabra Mogabele, Physics, Shimi, uh, Chemistry, Tariq uh, Tabi, Natural, uh, Biology, Mashq uh, Khat, Calligraphy, Siyag, uh, which is uh, also a very classical profession in Iran. Rasm wa Nagashi, which is uh, a drawing. Gymnastic, yes, uh, new elements. It's uh, the same uh, guy, but uh, with the English uh, uh, translation. That's another guy, Agha Fazlullah, and his father is Janab Agha Muhammad Bagher. The same, he has, uh, I think, better uh, grades. <laughs> he is from the, he is from the uh, eighth grade, so he's the, in, um, uh, what we said is almost uh, already high school. That's the growth of the tarbiyat into the high school level, not only uh, mil uh, intermediate, um, um, elementary. And this guy is Agha Sayyid Ali, and his father is the Marhum, um, Hazrat something, I don't know, just not clear. That's another one. Uh, Saadat Emeli Boys School, Najafabad, 1934, just before closure. Saadat Emeli Girls School, Najafabad, 1934. Saadat Emeli Girls School, Najafabad. Of course, again, the Yabahawal Abha in the middle. Yes, I'm 
So in conclusion, what we have here, the establishment of Baha'i schools in Iran served not only the Iranian state's need in modern schools and education, but also the Baha'i principle of modern universal education and the need to secure the continued growth of the Baha'i community. Uh, the Baha'i schools formed the environment in which non-Baha'i students and their families interacted with Baha'is and Baha'i principles. And of course, get to know those and with some uh, of course, converting to the new uh, religion. Non-Baha'is who attended Baha'i schools did it for a variety of reason, reasons, but mainly because in remote places, they often were, they, I mean the Baha'i schools, were often the only schools providing modern education, while in the urban centers, it was usually their superior standard of education. And the Baha'i schools created an atmosphere of intercommunality, the like of which had not existed in Iran at grassroots level. I thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Shafar, for such a, a, an interesting presentation. You've raised a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas, and I know I, for one, have been uh, very edified. Um, it, the, the most interesting question to me was the first one, why the Qajars would even have allowed the Baha'is uh, to open such schools. And the confluence of all these strains uh, was a fascinating and um, persuasive, as far as I was concerned, the, the need to reform Iran, the pressure from people who wanted to better their economic conditions, um, the whole concept of modern technology and the creation of the wireless and so on, exposing the people of Iran to the new possibilities. Um, and, and then, of course, the liberal mindedness of Mosaf Faruddin Shah um, and, and the cleverness in allowing individual Baha'is to open schools and not the community. So, the confluence of all these things. Very interesting. I think we may have time for one question. So, let's see who's going to shoot their hand up first. Um, okay, the lady there. Uh, let me quickly repeat the question for those who didn't hear in the back. Uh, a couple of questions rolled into one. The first is, um, were the Baha'i schools actually closed first, or were the Christian, especially the Presbyterian schools, uh, closed initially, and were the Baha'i schools collateral damage? And the second was the question about uh, the, a, a view within the Russian for, foreign policy groups um, and, and where those documents came from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, regarding the first question, um, well, there is uh, an indication that already in the late 1920s, uh, Reza Shah started to a trend of bringing foreign uh, schools uh, or non-state schools, private schools, under the supervision of the government. For example, uh, uh, in a certain stage, uh, prohibiting uh, the teaching of uh, French language in the French schools to uh, Muslim uh, uh, students. So it's a gradual thing, but regarding the closure, uh, as far as uh, my research goes, the Baha'i uh, schools were the first. After that, of course, uh, there is even a document uh, by the Americans, uh, by American uh, diplomats over there, that they're saying um, what, uh, what repercussions would be on the Christian schools. So on the, on the Christian uh, presence in uh, Iran, and that's an indication that uh, they have uh, they been closed later. Regarding the second uh, question, uh, sources vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Russian uh, connection, those were found in uh, Russian archives, about five Russian archives, different ones. Uh, those who are dealing with. Uh, um, Specifically, with the, what I said regarding the Russians, they are from St. Petersburg, uh, from the Baron Rosen collection, which we managed to get access to and uh, um, actually um, get the whole, uh, the, all the documents relating to the Baha'is. Regarding the accessibility, it is uh, to be decided by. Uh, um, uh, myself and uh, my colleagues in the academic com uh, committee of the Ezri Center, what, what we are going to, to do with these documents. Of course, those documents will be published, uh, some of them uh, will be published 
or actually most of them will be published in two volume work on the it titled the Baha'is of Iran, Transcaspia and the Caucasus, which will be, I believe, published either to 2010 or the beginning of 2011. And uh, so you could have access through that. Uh, whether whoever has uh, enough knowledge of Russian and enough knowledge of how to decipher uh, 19th century old Russian, that's something else. We can talk about academic cooperation in the co context of academic cooperation. We can afford you the, uh, the chance to uh, view them. Shall we go for more? Or? It's up to you. I mean, uh, One more. Okay. One more question. Yes. Oh, sorry, this lady over here. Sorry. That's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice track. Yeah. Please, you. Well, my guess is like yours, but I would say with the impact that the, with the role that the Baha'i played in the number of uh, fields, whether it is education, whether it is women emancipation, whether it is uh, in the health uh, sector, uh, whether it is uh, in uh, business and trade and the various of, uh, subject, socioeconomic subject, I would say that uh, uh, probably the standard of education in Iran would have been much better today than it was, and it was uh, in relation to the, you know, to the environment, Middle Eastern in the environment. It is still high, uh, but I, I would assume that it would have been much, much better, much. Uh, and of course, this would have reflected in many other things because education is a source of many, many other things. So it could have been, uh, you know. Uh, Iran could have been more democratic today, more respective of uh, human rights. Uh, and yes, we can dream on what Iran could be, but unfortunately, Payam Achavan knows it very well. <laughs> okay. Well, you folks can make a choice. You can either have a 10 minute break or you can continue asking questions. Well, they can, uh, those you want who to want continue? To uh, perhaps those of you, we could do it this way. Those of you who would wish to take a 10 minute break, you can um, quietly perhaps proceed out. And why don't we have another uh, five minutes of questions and answers since Dr. Shafar has come such a long way to be with us? All right? So, you want, you so want me? next question. That's yes, it. this gentleman here. Yes, the, yes, in the white. Mm -hmm. The Baha'i schools? The Taid was in Hamadan. The Taid Hamadan. And uh, I think I mentioned uh, each school where it, uh, it was. Yes. yes. The influence was of uh, great uh, importance because, for example, if uh, um, throughout the uh, course, um, uh, private papers of uh, a certain Baha'i uh, person that I found in the uh, United States National Baha'i Archives, there is a, a talk about uh, um, those American uh, uh, figures that were involved in the Tarbiat or in other schools they're asking for, from their friends in either New Zealand or the United States to send this or the other accessories that they didn't exist in Iran, which means that they were very much uh, attentive to the, to, uh, and very much uh, um, thoughtful of the need to raise that standard as much as possible, to bring maps, for example, or to bring certain books that didn't exist in order to read the story, for example, books in English. So it, there were certain uh, Baha'i schools that had labs, libraries, that never heard of in other schools. So it was very, very, uh, I would say, positive impact. And uh, 
they were also very uh, strict in the matters of discipline. Uh, and uh, in certain instances, it's not only disciplining the students, it's also disciplining the, the Iranian uh, uh, management committee of the, those schools. There is actually, you can read it in the book, uh, kind of a tension from time to time between the American staff and uh, uh, the Iranian uh, Baha'i leadership because in their view, the Iranians are not, even though they are Baha'is, they are not open or liberal enough in certain matters. And there is kind of, a, for example, for the American female or American woman to be in, in, in this committee or to decide certain things. Yes, there is also a tension like that, but I would say that definitely the impact is very positive. been told we need yes, to repeat yeah. the questions through the mic for the recording. So the question that preceded this answer was, was there an influence? What was the influence of bringing teachers in from outside the country? Can we give so. the gentleman here? That, uh, yes. I was wondering if there uh, were significant numbers of Jewish or Zoroastrian and Hindu Should it be your voice because you are the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, were there, uh, I guess, significant or any numbers of Zoroastrians, Christians, and, and Jewish children who attended these Baha'i schools? Well, uh, Christians, because they had their own uh, schools um, and they were uh, modernized schools, they less tended to either convert or to uh, uh, attend the Baha'i schools. But... Uh, uh, Jews and Zoroastrians, yes, they were growing numbers, especially in the towns and cities that uh, they were heavily populated by Jews, for example, Hamadan or Kashan, or by Zoroastrian Yazd. So uh, in those areas, of course, they were heavily uh, um, attended by uh, those uh, uh, minorities. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, this uh, lady was wondering what uh, Dr. Shafar's motivation was in pursuing this line of research and what uh, he's hoping to contribute in, in sharing this information with the world at large. Thank you. Um, I explained this uh, quite in detail in the lecture that was yesterday, so I, in order not to bore those who have already heard this, I will just uh, make it short. Um, the reason is that as a scholar specializing in Iran, more and more, wherever I uh, read a book or an article or thing, the question pops up, uh, Baha'is are uh, you know, uh, the biggest religious minority. How come they're not mentioned here? How come they're not mentioned here? How come they're not mentioned? And they are throughout the society, I will say. They are not a secluded minority in one place, one geographical place or uh, they weren't involved in the government from top to top. There were officials, they were, uh, I, as I said before, they were in the royal family, they were uh, from top to bottom. Officials here and there, diplomats, yes, the representative of Iran in the United States, the consul uh, was a Baha'i, and many other, uh, so they were everywhere. So how come it's not, they are not talked, there must be a reason, and that, that's when I attended a conference in uh, Landeg in 2002, the theme of it was education, then I started to ask this uh, question regarding the schools. And from the schools, I started to look at the other things. And the reason I'm doing this is, uh, I think, uh, as being truthful to your profession. As a scholar, you want to get to the truth. I mean, what's the idea of uh, uh, combining a pile of uh, lies in order to... Uh, satisfy this or another. You want to get to the truth. What were the reasons? You're asking why this thing happened. So why this thing happened? You have to crisscross a number of sources and uh, try to uh, create a balanced picture. If you, in other words, only trust Iranian sources or sources that are coming out of Iran, then uh, I probably wouldn't stand here before you. You wouldn't have invited me and uh, my lecture would be how negative the Baha'is are. But if you, put it, if you put it in a larger context, you use uh, 
as I did the uh, Russian archival material, British archival material, the material in uh, Haifa, in the Baha'i World Center in uh, Vilmet, and uh, as primary sources, uh, memoirs of Baha'is, non-Baha'is, uh, you create, you get a different picture. Uh, and uh, why I'm doing this, I mean, uh, it's, it's simple. I mean, uh, of course, uh, somebody asked me yesterday this question, uh, are you not afraid of the repercussions that it might? If you read the beginning of the book, I actually is very criti I'm very critical of the Iranian historiography, of the historiography on modern Iran, because there is no mention of the Baha'is. Unless the scholar is a Baha'i, he has a mention here and there about some role that they played. But, uh, you know, you have to... I don't want to say, give me a medal for being a bold uh, guy, but uh, <laughs> I take my chances. <laughs> at, at least you will invite me, I hope, not... Uh, <laughs>